Welcome to the Ministry of God's Word presented by Thamu Naidu. Thamu is the apostolic and founding elder of Gate Ministry Santon, located in Gauteng, South Africa. Blessed with worldwide travel and teaching, his mandate is to communicate the ancient biblical blueprint for the accurate building of the Church of God. So, I'm doing the series with you on righteousness, and I was thinking this morning about how I should introduce my thoughts to you today. And I couldn't help but think that this is arguably one of the most practical series we could be doing because it de deals with the day-to-day -day issues of life. And uh, I can take any, any section of the series I'm doing, like presently on the subject of finance, and it could become a series in itself, simply because it deals with some extremely practical areas of one's life and uh, how we should live out our lives. So the application of what you're hearing uh, can be installed into uh, your way of life, and uh, it can be practical. One of the greatest challenges we could have is hearing the message, leaving the place, and neglecting to, to implement the things we hear. So practicing what you hear is, is a critical uh, you know, requirement. And so, so this series, whatever area we touch, could be a sub-series in itself, if not a series alone. But all of this is related to the subject of righteousness. And as I told you, righteousness is the template that has been pre-existently designed by God for how we should function, our, uh, function in this life. God designed the human race to function in a certain way. And he designed every compartment of our lives, how it should function. So nothing has been left to our imagination or to our own personal opinions or choices. Everything has been predetermined by God. God elected us to be born into the world, and God has chosen for how we should live our lives in every area of our lives. That is why God's Word is a lamp and a light to, to, to our feet and to our way. And uh, living by God's Word is is critical. So you come here on a Sunday to receive the Word so that it can become your torch, your light, your compass, your GPS uh, in terms of uh, how you walk your life. And the critical part is that we learn to adjust our lives to the way God wants it to. And the area of finance is a critical area in this whole in this whole walk. In fact, a large percentage of our lives are directly and indirectly uh, affected by money matters. And, um, and while th this area has been so mutilated uh, and abused in some church circles, it's an area that has to be addressed so that each one of us know how to order our steps correctly in this life, especially in the area of finance. Now, I should start by telling you that God did not create money. God did not create currencies. God didn't create uh, the, the, the exchanges that we use to transact in a monetary way in life. God did not create the land. He did not create the dollar. He did not create the pound, he did not create the euro, and he has not created any currency that we have in the world today. These, these fiat currencies have been created by human beings, and obviously these currencies hold you and me captive to a large degree. Our lives cannot exist without money, and obviously in every facet of our lives we need money. We need money. But God created wealth. And wealth is not measured by money. Wealth is measured by 
everything God has created to sustain your spirit, your soul, and your flesh. Okay, so wealth has got to do with the sustenance of one's spirit, one's soul, and one's body or flesh. And in every area of our creative being, God has created sufficient uh, provisions to sustain us. And when you are sustained in your spirit, soul, and body, you are wealthy. In fact, one of the words for glory is wealth. One of the definitions of the word glory, kabod or doxa, kabod Hebrew, uh, doxa Greek, uh, these words that's translated glory also means your wealth. So when the glory of God comes upon you, um, it is intended to ensure that you are wealthy in your spirit, in your soul, and in your flesh. So when we talk about uh, being sustained by God or being prosperous, the Bible says, for example, in, in 3 John, the epistle of John, it says that, that, as you, that you prosper even as your soul prospers. It's literally saying that in, uh, the whole idea of prosperity there is not the accumulation of assets, so that you can say that you are rich, a rich person by economic measures. But it's, it's the development of your entire being holistically. So uh, in that, that, um, that we, are, we are well cared for in every part of our beings. Let me tell you, you can be extremely wealthy without having an asset register of things. You can be extremely blessed without um, without being measured economically as rich. Uh, uh, Jesus is a typical example of that. He is the he was not just the creator of the heavens and the earth. Uh, uh, I mean, the pre-existent creator, he was the word. But when he took on the form of a human body, he, he also um, learned how not to let those things he created control him because he understood that they were created for him. He was not created for them. And if he positioned himself right, then everything created will serve him and he didn't have to worship it. He knew that he was the possessor of all things, but in being the possessor of all things, he was not going to allow himself to be possessed by the things he possessed. And the big challenge today is learning how not to become possessed or obsessed with the things that we are supposed to possess. And this is, this is called stewardship. Stewardship, which is a, an ability to manage resources without resources consuming you. And so God is calling the church presently to understand uh, these matters. Now, there is a template for how you should live your lives in terms of um, the management of resources and uh, your representation in life. And uh, for want of a better word, I would refer to this as your vocational life how you live your lives as a working person, as an employed person, or as an employer of employees, or whatever you are, whatever you are. Um, and it is very important that you understand righteousness or the design of God for how you should function in life. That is in the marketplace, uh, in your places of employment, uh, or wherever you find yourself presently. God expects us to live our lives in a certain way. And, um, and uh, the way we live our lives here will determine our view of things, our view, our approach, our perspective of life. And um, so last week, and I don't think I, I presented my thoughts as well as I should have presented it last week, but... But I want to just at least in a, in a succinct way highlight today how important it is for us to understand some of the things concerning our lives lived on the earth uh, vocationally as employed people. The first thing that you have to understand, and this is, this is if, if I had to call this 
uh, if I had to reference this, this would be the first step in your, in, on the rung of your ladder if you want to know how to exist meaningfully, if you want to know how to engage the environment that you are in, and if you want to break out of this view, this ideological view of existentialism, and existentialism will teach you that you exist to, to choose how you want to live. Okay, so a person who chooses to, to live by the philosophy of this world imposes his or her free will on how they want to live. And that is a person who exists to impose his hair liberal, democratic, ideological view on life. Uh, but here's the first thing you have to understand if you are breathing, and all of us are breathing, okay? Um, yeah, I hope. <laughs> uh, here's the first thing you have to understand about life, and that is that you were born to live for another. Okay, if you didn't realize that when you were born, then you should have realized that when you were born again. Galatians chapter 2 is a very powerful scripture, and I'll just give you this as one of the references. Uh, and we can read this, Galatians chapter 2, you can read from verse, uh, I think about 18, 19. For I, through the law, died to the law that I may live to God. So I'm not going to live pedantically, legalistically, religiously, ritually, ceremonially, or however way I live. But I have to die to a certain pattern that tries to, to regulate my life if I want to live to God. So one of the things that we try to do in, this, in our corporate gatherings, and this is the, the job of people like myself, is to deconstruct mentality so that we can bring back the mind of God into our thinking. All of us have been taught to survive. All of us have been taught to survive in what we would call the concrete jungle. Uh, and, and the law of this concrete jungle is the survival of the fittest. Uh, it's predatorial. Uh, it's called, it, that's why it's called the system of the beast. Okay, the whole Babylonian system is beastly, and if you understand the animalistic nature of the beast, it's there to, to prey upon you. It's there to devour you. If you don't know how to become tough, if you don't know how to defend yourself, protect yourself, that's why it promotes self-interest, suspicion, uh, mistrust for people. Uh, this whole system of the world is geared to teach you how um, not to trust anyone, uh, how to to, to you know, watch yourself, protect your interest, etc. Um, but people like myself, we are here to teach, to deconstruct that mentality because that is a very dangerous, self-centered mentality. It's part of the system of this world. Um, and we know it, we know the present political climate will tell you how when suddenly a leadership changes, how certain positions and how people change opinions and attitudes and how quickly uh, uh, betrayal becomes uh, in the, the normative culture of the day. Uh, you can't trust anyone in the world today. Uh, you know, in, in colloquial language, the system of the world works on, on, on the simple principle of you scratch my back and I'll scratch yours. You know, um, in the language of, of South Africa, which we are very comfortable with knowing today, it's called bribery. Bribery. And I'll talk about that later. But this is what it says in verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. Say to your neighbor, I no more live. It is Christ who lives in me. But Christ lives in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, that's the human body, I live by faith in the Son of God. In other words, not just by faith in believing in the Son of God, but believing that I am the Son of God because I'm being conformed to His image. Um, live by faith 
in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's how he gave himself so that his spirit now dominates over me. I do not, uh, I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. All right, so if we unpack that portion of Scripture, it's firstly highlighting for us that I do not live for myself. I only live for him, and Christ lives in me. That is the basis. That's the basis. In other words, you died the day you received him. No more you live, but he lives in you. This must be key. I can't over-explain it, over-emphasize it, because if you can understand everything else I'm going to say after this, it is based upon that. So wherever you are, you are not living. Christ, in his variegated expressions, in the multiplicity of his grace, is represented through you. We call this a ubiquitous representation. While God is omnipresent, God has chosen omnipresence through a process called being ubiquitous, being everywhere at the same time through the human representation. So the, through the human body, he is everywhere. Well, he is omnipresent, he knows all things, he chooses to be present in you, in me, in me. So wherever you are, Christ is present. You died so that he can now ascend to the throne of your life. He lives in you. And whatever you do now, you live it by faith. And faith tells you that I'm living for him. That literally means that, that whatever you do is a representation of him. So, keep that at the back of your mind. Now, when it comes to the things I tried to highlight yesterday, last week, especially the things from the book of Malachi, whatever labor you, uh, whatever the, the rewards of your labor are, okay, we call that the fruit of your hands. In today's language, we'll call that salaries, wages, uh, income received, etc. Whatever fruit you receive, whatever income you receive, is, is the fruit of your labors. Fruit of your labors. It's the fruit of your representation of Christ. And because the currencies of this world try to measure your labor, uh, value and weigh your labor, they give it to you in installments called wages or salaries. Or, or, you know, so they give it to you in incremental amounts, in small amounts, all right? And um, these, these, these incomes become an expression of your work, of your employment. So whatever comes into your hand is only an expression or a representation of what you have been doing in your vocations, in your workplace. And God refers to these things as the fruits of righteousness. Now, the, the money is not the fruit of righteousness, but what it represents is the fruit of righteousness. And God is asking us that in our lives, that whatever we present must become an expression of righteous living. So if you have, for example, if you've been working, knowing that you are a representation of God, that you function vicariously, you are a substitute of him, whatever you have in you, he has installed it. That's your giftings, your gracings, the anointings, the glories, the administrations of the Holy Spirit in you, whatever, the wisdom, the knowledge, the understanding, the fruits of the Spirit, all of that stuff is in you, and you're out there in the marketplace. You're representing God, and that representation is expressed through a salary earned. And when you come to a gathering like this and you present it, you're not presenting money. You're presenting your acts of, uh, of righteousness to God. And when God looks at that, he's not looking at the money. He's looking at your representation. That's why I told you about the two careers 
of two men uh, that was presented to us at the beginning of creation. In fact, there are many beginnings in the scripture, but one of the beginnings is when careers were formed. And that beginning is two men. One was a farmer and one was a herdsman, uh, um, an owner of cattle. And they developed their careers over a process of time. And these were both sons of, uh, of Adam. And, and, and when they developed their careers over a process of time, they had to now test whether their careers was a good representation before God. And they learned that the litmus test of, uh, of establishing whether their careers would be accepted would be by building two altars. And the altars will be like scales that will measure, measure or weigh whether their careers were acceptable or unacceptable, whether God will receive it or reject it. And uh, so the farmer brought his fruit and vegetables and presented it to God, and uh, the herdsman brought his uh, animals and presented it to God, and God was going to determine whose career he is going to approve. And obvi obviously, if both of them pleased him, he would have accepted both the careers. Uh, but he found that when he measured how they represented him vocationally, one's heart was filled with ambition and selfish desires and, uh, and the pursuit for his own ambition, uh, uh, own, uh, own pleasures, and uh, he was driven by self-aggrandizement and, 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 you know, all the symbols of success in life. He lived for himself, but he just wanted to do the stuff that he thought religious people should do, and that was give God a donation. And so he gave God what we would call a minka offering, which was the imposition of the human will on how you presented an offering to God. And when God looked at career versus offering, he could not found, find equity in it. He could not find uh, uh, a balance. It, 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 was, it could not weigh up because your career was you doing your own stuff, and then you bring an offering to, with the hope that I will wink at what you've done, and you will accept the career. And I can't do that, God said. So I reject it because you're disconnected. You live with sin at your door. Uh, you are hateful and competitive and jealous. Uh, and and uh, you, you're there to, to outperform your brother and see how you, know, you can be a better person than him uh, from a vocational point of view. And that's how the spirit of competition comes. And then there's the other guy who doesn't live for himself but only lives for God. And he chooses only to represent God, and he brings a first fruit offering. And the first fruit offering, or the first lings, as we refer to it, is an indication. If you understand the first fruit teachings, and you can get it from, from my series on biblical economics, um, the first cannot be dedicated. The first belongs to God. The first cannot be consecrated. And when you give the first, you're actually acknowledging that everything you have is the Lord's. And this guy lived, he lived only for God, and God accepted his, uh, his offering. So one career was accepted and one was rejected based upon the fact that one's offering, God deemed his works as righteous. That's what Hebrews 11.4 says. God deemed his works as righteous. The word works that means his employment, his, 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 the profile of his job, his career as righteous. So God wasn't looking at, uh, at the actual job. So let's say, for example, for want of a better description, and I don't want to in any way demean anyone here, but let's say by our secular and economic definitions or sociological definitions, you know, doing a menial job like being a janitor, uh, is one of the lower jobs on the rung of our, of our ladder. Uh, but let's say God gave you the grace to clean bathrooms and toilets, or, or to clean streets and buildings. And you do it with grace, with joy, with pleasure, because obviously you need clean streets. Somebody has to clean it. You need clean toilets. You need clean bathrooms. Somebody has to do it. Sometimes I don't think we appreciate the people that do it for us in our homes. And they, you have to have tremendous ability to do that. Tremendous grace and skill. And somebody does it because, remember, Jesus became all things to all men. 
He didn't come being born uh, you know, in, in, in a palace, in a palatial building. He was born in a stable, in, a, in the manger, of the feeding trough of a stable. I mean, this is, this is you know, animals are not clean. Okay, they, they don't have a bath every day. And if they do, okay, let me not go there. <laughs> and Jesus was born there. And later on, if you read some of the things I may say today, he became poor. He had to learn how to become poor so that he can minister to us in our riches. And, and his social status was not that of a, of a citizen uh, uh, of Rome of, or of the Hebrew nation, but he was a doulos, a slave. You know how low that is on the rungs of the ladder to become a slave? Extremely low. Uh, but Jesus chose that status just to show us uh, uh, how low a person can, may sometimes have to go to so that you can minister to others. So, so Jesus became all things. Uh, and, he, and he would show us that, that you know, um, the opinions of people don't matter. Uh, it's where your joy is and where your representation is. It should be a pleasure. It should be a pleasure for us to serve God no matter where we are without letting status get in the way uh, of what we do. So, so the key here and the critical part of, of this message is understanding that wherever we are representing God, our representation is a representation of Christ. I don't live, but Christ lives in me. Have you got that? And, and when we get that, we'll understand that all men are equal and God has no prejudice. God does not give any special favor to anybody. We think certain people are more important than others. Not so with God. So in our giving, our lives are presented to God as sacrifices of righteousness. So when you present your offerings, this is the point I'm making. When you present your offerings, you don't think about the amount. Some of you may give a huge amount. And some of you may give a small amount. But God doesn't work in amounts. He works in percentages especially when it comes to structured giving. And there is a structured giving that is governed by the royal law, not the Hebrew law, the Jewish, Jewish law, the law of Moses. For example, for example, let's say somebody hands, you know, a social grant of 1,600 or whatever rand, and they give 1,600 rand, which is 10%, uh, one, 160 rand, which is 10% uh, of the income. And somebody earns 1.6 million, and they give 160,000 rand uh, as a tide. So who gave more? No, it's, it's, uh, both gave the same amount because both gave 10%. God's into percentages. He's not into amounts. Yeah, the rich man could say, oh, I gave so much. No, you didn't give so much. You gave the same. As the, as the one who just picked up a social grant. You gave the same. You gave the same. Who gave more? If, 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 uh, if all of us follow the first root principle that the first week's income or 2.5% of your total gross income for the year belongs to the Lord and, um, and one person gave a few thousand rand and, and another person gave a few million rand, the, one, the, the million rand is not more than the person who gave a few thousand because your representation as in the ability God has put within you determines what you give but both of you have given in percentages God is into percentages he is not into amounts are you understanding? but those percentages are representation of, of, of the sacrifices of righteousness. So I can't compare myself and say, oh, I've given so much, so I, I should get more mileage, more recognition, and so forth, because all of this has got to do with representation, got to do with how I am stewarding the things that, I, that God wants me to steward. So these are critical aspects in mindsets that, that, that we need to, um, uh, to take note of. So in our giving, our lives are presented to God as sacrifices of righteousness. The requirement of any presentation of God should be an indication of 
of our lives. So when God asks you to present an offering unto him, it's a representation of your vocation. Um, so don't get caught up with the actual gift or the amount. Get caught up with the representation. That's the key I'm saying, I'm making here. The gift must be compliant with the requirement of the heavenly standards. What are the heavenly standards? I live for God. I am called to represent God in the vocation that he has placed me. My giving is a fruit of my labors, a symbolic fruit of my labors. My gifts must literally and symbolically represent my life. So, for example, if whoever put this hundred rand into the offering today, when God looks at it, he's not looking at, oh, handsome Mandela. <laughs> no, he's not looking at Mandela. He's looking at the, the, the image of the person who put this in. Your image is on this. And he, when he looks at your image, he's, he's, he's looking at it and he's asking the question, is it blind? Is it marred? Is it maimed? Is it disconnected from purpose, from destiny, from pre-existence? Is it a true representation of me? Am I seeing the image of Thamo or am I seeing the image of Christ in Thamo? Am I seeing sweat, blood, anger, theft, fraud, uh, corruption? Or am I seeing inspiration, the breath of heaven, the joy of the Holy Spirit, the fruits of righteousness? What am I looking at in this offering? So, so it's critical. It's critical that, that, that you understand these things. These are tough things because I know that most of you are living in the real world. That's what you're going to tell me. Okay? But I'm telling you about the real stuff. Okay? Not fake news. Now real stuff. All right? This is the real stuff. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Now, one of the greatest tests of representation was found in the life of Abraham. Remember the portion of Scripture. He is the father of our faith, and, and the Scripture says that Abraham believed, and he was reckoned righteous. You all know that? He believed. I told you last week, and I want to say it again, that belief doesn't happen overnight. I wish belief was because you could take a few scriptures you learned and you could quote them by heart. And then people can say, wow, you believe. I wish it was so easy. I wish I can just quote a few scriptures. You know, uh, I was thinking recently because I'm being tested by every word I preach. I'm being tested by messages that come to haunt me at night because I'm supposed to preach messages that I've made the altar call to first. And I come short on many occasions because um, I'm learning how to become what I preach. Sometimes I beg God not to let me preach a certain message because I don't think I'm there altogether. But at the same time, I realize that having preached to others, I can't myself become a castaway. So I have to learn how to beat my body into subjection so that I can live by the things I preach. Abraham, it took him about 24 years of his life to develop or inculcate a lifestyle of faith. And remember, Abraham was not, you know, he was not a prophet like we understand prophets today or somebody in full-time ministry. In fact, most of the people in the Old Testament were in a vocational career. Jews generally, apart from the, the Levites and the high priest, all had to do some vocation. Um, Abraham was a businessman and a pretty successful businessman. Uh, he, he amassed, you know, large pieces of property, and, um, and he also, you know, measured his wealth by uh, the cattle, the camels, the, the animals, the oxen, the sheep, the goats uh, that, he, that he possessed, the silver, the gold, all that stuff. I mean, he became very rich, the kind of servants he had. We knew that at least 318 of them were so powerful that they could, they could constitute an army. Uh, and at one stage, Abraham himself uh, conf uh, came before a coalition of four kings, uh, uh, Chedaloma and, 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 and the coalition. 
uh, and um, Abraham defeated them. And these four kings had just defeated a coalition of five kings and, uh, that ruled over Sodom and Gomorrah. And uh, so Abraham was a very powerful man. And one of those kings was Nimrod, who built Babel, uh, the Babylonian uh, capital, uh, Babel. So he was a very powerful man, Abraham. But the Bible tells us that Abraham, later on in his life, after his child was born, he went through a test. He went through a test. And this, um, this test is found for us in Genesis 22. And I want to read it to us today because, you know, it's easy to say you believe God. It's very easy for people to talk about believing God. It's another thing to believe Him when you're asked to do the impossible. And Abraham was reckoned righteous because he believed God. He believed God. Do you know this whole calculation, this whole estimation, uh, is not something that happens op- overnight. It's, it's a process of time. And look at what it says. Now it came to pass, after these things, that God tested Abraham. God tested Abraham. Abraham. I mean, that's a, that, that word test is a very powerful word. It literally means to try him, to tempt him, uh, to prove him, to provoke him. Or it also means to, 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 to put him through an adventure that will bring him to show proof that he really believes. So this is not a confession of a lip. It's easy to say, I believe, with your lips. It's another thing when God will test you to see whether you really believe. And this is what happens here. And he said to, uh, 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 and he said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. This is my position. I'm standing before you. And he said, take now your son, your only son, Isaac. And remember, Isaac means laughter. And this boy brought lots of laughter to Abraham and Isaac, uh, Abraham and Sarah, um, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. Now, you know the story. Let me, let me take a few steps back. You can read this when you go to portions of Scripture like Genesis 15, 16, and so forth. Abraham has a conversation with God. And the conversation is, I don't have a hair. And everything I have is going to go to Eliza, who is like a son to me, but he's not, he's not born out of the lo- my loins. He does not come out of the body of Sarah. And God said to him, no, it won't be Eliza. It will be somebody that comes out of your body. And Abraham took that word took the word, and he believed God. But after a few years, the boy did not get born. His wife was still barren. And she was getting on in age. She was getting on in age. And so Abraham, at the age of 85, after God had told him this, the age of 85, his wife was 10 years younger than him, did something that was foolish. But he did it believing that that was the most appropriate thing to do. In other words, make your own plan. How many people will not take the advice of God and choose their own way? Choose their own way. He listened to Sarah who said to him, listen, this lady that serves me, Hagar. Now, Hagar, remember when, they were, when there was a great famine in the land, Abraham went to Egypt. And when he was in Egypt, out of just simple survival, he said to his wife, you are so beautiful, Men will be attracted to you in Egypt, including its higher echelons of leadership. So my suggestion is when people ask you who you are to me, tell them you're my sister. And the the answer was correct because he married his sister in a way because this is his brother's daughter he married. He married his brother's daughter. And, um, And so... The news got to Pharaoh that this woman is, is Abraham's sister, and so Pharaoh took her in. And every time he was about to make an approach to him, 
An angel came and smote him with a, well, you know, attacked him. Uh, it's called a plague in the scripture. So eventually Pharaoh realized you don't touch this woman because there's something here. And when he inquires, he discovers that this is Abraham's wife. And so out of deep fear because of the encounter he had with this angel, out of deep fear, he tells Abraham, please leave the land. Take every resource you need, and he gives them, and he gives to Abraham servants. And one of the servants he gives is his own daughter called Hagar, but she is a daughter of one of his concubines. And so he gives them, he gives Hagar to Abraham, and he says, Please, I'll do anything just to appease the wrath of God. Take Hagar, she'll serve you, she'll, she'll you mentor. And Sarah mentors her until Hagar becomes a split representation of, of him. And, um, and Sarah says, use her as a surrogate. Let her, I can't have children. And so Abraham makes the mistake of not realizing that this child is going to come out of the body of Sarah. He goes into Hagar because she is the most exact representation of Sarah. Only later to discover now, this is going to create a problem because it produces not only an Ishmael, but an Ishmael with 12 sons will become, which would become counterproductive and competitive to the nation of Israel. All right, and you know the Hagar problem the Israels, Israelites are still confronted with up till today. That's the war that takes place in the Middle East until today. So he made many mistakes, but what am I saying? In your journey of faith, you will be tested and in your testings, you'll find an easy way to get out of your problems. You'll run from your problems. That's why I tell people, don't run. Stay there. Stay there. Stay there. Option B is an easy option. You'll never get it in my counseling session. Why? Because the, hard, the best way is to fight until you get God's purpose and not your own way. That's what is being highlighted here. So it is in that context God says, now, and this boy by now, according to some traditions, they don't say he was a teenager, even though he's referred to as a lad. They say he's about 30 odd years old. So this is now, you know, Abraham gives birth to Isaac at the age of 100, and, um, and maybe 30 odd years later, Isaac is a grown man. All of the future of Abraham Everything he has is now in his hair. It's not Eliezer, it's Isaac. Uh, Isaac is going to become, is the son of promise, is the son of covenant, is the son of the blessings of God, and so forth. So you put all your hope in your son. And then God says to him, give me your son as a living sacrifice. This is what you call the sacrifices of righteousness. Give me your son. And I don't want you just to give him to me academically and theoretically. I want you to cut him up into pieces. I mean, this is, this is, this is not, this is murder. This is human sacrifice. This is devilish. And God says, give him as a sacrifice. Give him as a sacrifice. And Abraham makes the choice, and he says, yes, Lord, I will do it. And so they make the journey in verse 7, but Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, my father, and he said, here I am, my son. And he said, look, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, my son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together. And later on you would find that they come to the place of which God had told him, and Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood in order. And he bound Isaac his son, laid him on the altar upon the wood, and Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. And he said, do not lay your hand on the lad or do, and, or do anything to him. 
For now I know that you fear God. Listen to this. You fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Then Abraham, then, everyone say then, lifted his eyes and looked, and there behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering instead of his son. And Abraham called the name of the place, the Lord will provide, or Jehovah Jireh. As it is to this day, in the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. So what happens? Only after the test, in him offering the sacrifice of righteousness, not his son, he was offering, he understood he never lived for himself. So any demand God made was not a demand on him. It was a demand that, that would express his representation of God. It sounds crude by human and present day standards. But God was highlighting a point here. And at the point of him learning how to disconnect and give up something, that's when God introduced himself for the first time to Abraham as Jehovah Jireh. The God of the mountains will provide. Let me tell you something. Unless you learn how to give up your Isaac, and we all have things that produce laughter in our lives, things that we're very attached to, and things that we have vested our lives upon. Um, we will never come to understand what it means to give God a pure offering. So it's critical that, our, that everything we do, and let me tell you something, the biggest Isaacs today many of us have are jobs, careers, status, uh, finances, all of that. So our employment must demonstrate righteous living. Say to your neighbor, your work must demonstrate your righteousness. Our gifts must become a good indicator that we do not live for ourselves. You know, I like Hebrews 11.4. By faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. And let me tell you something. If, if animals is a more in, in, uh, excellent sacrifice, then believe me, this is vanity of the worst level, if animals. Because the Bible tells us God does not take pleasure in the sacrifice of animals. He does not. But so how can Abel have given animals, and God calls it more excellent? And the word more excellent here is a word that literally means preeminent, superior. But here's the key. Through which he obtained, he obtained witness that he was righteous. So your gifts become an indicator through which you can receive a divine testimony that you are righteous. Okay, your gift is not the indicator, but it is a good expression of where your heart is. Are you with me? Are you hearing me? You're very quiet. Um, are you hearing what I'm saying? It's critical. That's why, for me, there's no tokenism in giving. There's no sensationalism in giving. And, um, uh, and I think... If I had to track my own personal life, one of the areas I've been tested most in is the area of giving. And when I've learned how to give out of a cheerful and joyful heart uh, at the expense sometimes of tremendous discomfort, uh, I, I, I've also come to discover why the provisional nature of God, the providential nature of God is so great and why he supplies so beautifully. It is when you learn how to Get these principles right in your life. And I want to highlight this to the church here today, that if you want to receive a testimony, a witness, you know what's what, when I, the word witness is a key word in a court of law. It speaks about evidence, evidence. And it's credible evidence as an exhibit A, an exhibit B, an exhibit C, and so forth. You become an exhibit through your gift, there's an, uh, there, there is a manifestation of an exhibit that says, this person is righteous. This person is righteous. 
At God testifying of his gifts, and through it, he being dead still speaks. So offerings must become the fruit of your labors. Since we are the Lord's, then the, then the fruit of his hands are his. So whatever I have is not mine. Whether it is in my name or not, it's not mine. Giving is one of the most explicit demonstrations of the principle of righteousness. They declare that whatever we have belongs to God. That's why Psalm 4, 5 says, Offer the sacrifices of righteousness and put your trust in the Lord. Offer the sacrifices of righteousness and put your trust in God. In this way, you are not trusting in yourself. Um, uh, Acts 20, 35 says something, and if we can read maybe two verses before that. Acts 20, let me turn to it quickly. This is a spirit that needs to come into the church. The Apostle Paul, uh, let's read from verse 32. But now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance amongst all those who are sanctified. Okay, an inheritance, key words here. I have coveted, look at Paul, I've coveted no one's silver or gold or clothing. Yes, you yourselves know that these hands have provided for my necessities and for those who were with me. But verse 35 says, I've shown you in every way by laboring like this that you must support the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And this is the key. This, if you want to lay a foundation to your life, here's the key. I do not live for myself, I live for the Lord. Whatever I do, I am here in this life to give, not to receive. Uh, I think they posted, the, the church posted um, on social media, a statement from my Facebook page, the public page, that um, something about giving, how does it go? Something, something about uh, we must lose the fear of giving or something like that. Uh, they posted it and uh, somebody put what, giving what, basically, uh, what? <laughs> giving your life. Giving to others the benefit of the doubt. Giving forgiveness. It's called forgive. Uh, giving love. Giving the extra mile. Giving the inner garment when the coat is taken. Uh, giving the benefit to misinterpretation. Uh, giving, giving, giving in every facet of one's life. Learning how to give. Most people are selfish. It's about me, 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 I, me, my joy, my peace, my happiness. It's about my survival. For once, it's about me. That's egotistical. That's selfish. But giving is about learning how to do things unto the Lord. Here's a portion of scripture that I'll give you that I find to be very interesting. 2 Corinthians 8, verses 1 to 7. But I want to get to verse 5. Let's just do verse 5 because I've only got five minutes left. Can't believe it. Not for you, for me. And not only as we had hope, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and then to us by the will of God. And this is the key to giving. Giving is not about what you give. Not the money, not the coat, not the groceries, not what you've done for the poor, all of that stuff. So here's how giving starts. On the basis of learning, it's more blessed to give than to receive. Here's the basis of giving. You first give yourself to the Lord. And you don't give things to people, you give yourself to people. The Macedonian church, which was economically in a depraved and deprived area, in fact, they were, they were one of the poorer regions. Think of one of the poorest regions in our country, like the Eastern Cape or whatever. Just think about it. One of the poorest regions, 
and this region has mastered the skill of giving. And they are outgiving the richest region like Santon and Johannesburg. And you ask yourself, how can somebody from such a poor region or such a group of people from such a poor region give so much in comparison to, to a region that is economically advanced? And here's the secret. The Macedonians did not give money first or things, even though they were very liberal in the grace of giving. They learned how to give themselves. And they never gave themselves to others first. They first gave themselves to God and then to others. So and this is, if you want to build the principles of, uh, of how we are going to be righteous, the first thing you have to understand is I do not live. God lives in me. And so whatever I do, I do it unto him. And if he uses me in a certain context to give, then I am not giving things. That's called charity. But I'm giving myself. That's called sacrifice. Giving myself. And let me tell you, when you do give yourself, you will be offended. You will be hurt. You will be misunderstood and so forth. So the altar is the place where you come before God. And when you come before him, you're not giving things. You're giving your life. And because you can't give your life per se. For example, if I put a couple of hundred rand into the offering basket today, I couldn't, give, I, couldn't give, I couldn't put myself into the offering basket. For me to do that, I would have to kill myself. I have to die. That's suicide. So I have to find the best way to represent me. So I transfer myself into that thing that I'm giving. But I'm not transferring it into the money. I'm saying to the Lord, I'm giving you, and the, I'm giving myself to you, but I don't know how to do that. So receive this as an, a representation of me. So when God is looking at the offering, he's looking at me. And then when I'm blessing somebody else, which I really want to talk about in the weeks ahead, how to help the poor, the weak, the infirmed, I'm not giving, I'm not giving them a handout and then saying these people never appreciate anything I do. But I'm giving myself to them in the form of whatever I consider to be prudent in that context. Are you with me? Okay, say to your neighbor, give yourself. Okay, so when we say it is more blessed to give than to receive, what are we saying? Right, we're giving ourselves. That's what it means to be poured out as a drink offering unto the Lord. You know what's a drink offering? I grew up in a culture where my, well, not my parents, but some of my family, my uncles, when they opened a bottle of alcohol, they took the first shot and they poured it, poured it into the ground. And you, when you ask them why they poured it into the ground, they said they're giving to the dead. And it seemed like they always had enough alcohol after that. <laughs> Maybe it's a principle of sowing and reaping. <laughs> but the key is that you give, give yourself before you give amounts. Tokenism and posturing in the area of giving uh, is a big problem today in the church. Uh, but when you give yourself, that's where the greatest pleasure is. And let me tell you this. Every single person must learn this. There's a mentality out there that poor people do not have to give. In fact, if, you could, if I could only be given, well, I've tested this in certain villages in Africa. I taught poor people that it's more important for you to give than to look for a handout. I taught them how to place a moratorium on receiving handouts. I taught them how to learn how to give themselves and give unto the Lord. And today, some of them are prospering. God has made a way for them in a dry place, in a difficult environment. Why? Because we have taught people they should not be giving. You give yourself unto the Lord, and you look to give to others. You look to give. And in some areas in Africa, it works because the principle of Ubuntu and so forth are real issues where people will share the little they have. But when we do this in the right way, we'll break the spirit of poverty, and we will see prosperity come like we've never seen it before. Amen? Amen? Actually, I'm going too slow with the series, uh, but time tells me that it's up, and I can't, I have to stop. So stand with me.